Hey everyone, welcome to the Sword and Laser. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm Tom Merritt. And welcome to our Google Hangout. Today we are speaking to author Wesley Chu. Wes, thank you so much for being here. Hey, what's up guys? Thanks for having me. Yeah, of thanks for joining us. Uh, if anyone doesn't know, Wesley Chu has been a failed punter, a kung fu master, a uh, gymnast, IT worker, actor in a Haynes commercial, and more, and now a writer. He has written The Lives of Tao, which was a Goodreads Choice nominee in 2013, and also an Alex Award winner for the American Library Association's 2014 Youth Media Awards, as well as the follow-up to that book, The Deaths of Tao. Welcome again, Wesley. <laughs> now, is it, is it t Tao or Dao? It's Tao. It's Tao? Um, okay. It has nothing to do with Taoism. I, I think I've had a lot of people go up to me and be like, uh, I thought it was a religious book or a book about Taoism, and it's not, and you kind of <laughs> stuck for that. And I would like my money back. I would like my money back. I've been told that too, but um, yeah, it's about an alien named Tao. Okay. That's, that's good that we cleared that up. I always get concerned that I'm going to mispronounce something because that's kind of my MO in life is to mispronounce everything, especially uh, when I'm live on air with the author that wrote the work. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to be better about that. So I'm glad, right. I'm glad we cleared that up early. <laughs> so take us through the, the non-sports ball realization of the IT slash actor dual life thing that you've, that you've gone through and, and how you ended up as a writer. Uh, you know... My father is an English professor, you know. I, I think for him, it wasn't so much because he loved English so much when he went to college, but because back in the 70s, when you're from Taiwan, and the U.S. is like the big superpower, it's good to know the language of the country that, you know, is a superpower. So he's an English professor, and ever since I was a little kid, when I first moved here, since I was like five, you know, I was a big reader. It's kind of reading is kind of what got me to learn English, you know. And my, my, my dad, by the way, hates science fiction and fantasy. So, oh, no. <laughs> so, um, like, the first, I remember I was, like, five or six years old, and he, he brought me to the bookstore, and he was kind of like, buy whatever you want, son. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll buy it for you. And he basically, like, corralled me to the, to the Shakespeare and the, you know, mm -hmm. freaking Machiavelli or whatever it is. And, and back then, you know, I basically took off, and I ran towards the, the pictures of the, the manticore and the, and the magic, you know, basically it was, it was like a floating sword. It was a floating, shiny sword. It, it, it was Lawrence Walt Evans, The Misenchanted Sword, and Piers Anthony's the Spell for Chameleon. Oh, boy. So I read those two books, and that's kind of how I got started. So when I was in high school, I told my dad that I think I'm going to be an English major, just like you, Dad. And, 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 and not he, he didn't say, like, don't make the same mistake I made. But he basically implied it by saying, if you become an English major, your life will suffer. <laughs> Do whatever you want, but it's going to mean pain. Oh. You're going to be miserable for the rest of your life. Oh, no, 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 no. He, he, come on now. He, he would not let me do whatever I want. But when, he, when he said that, he was like, all right, and because of that, you're going to go study law or computer science. And 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 or you know, basically we knew that medicine was was out. You had already discounted medicine out of that equation, okay? I don't do good with blood, mm. and the, I'm I'm very careless. So the the thought of me like leaving like a pair of, like a like a scalpel in somebody's stomach was actually it's all too real. Oh, so, I know. Okay, let's not go. There. But um, so, yeah, I've had I've had enough surgery thoughts for oh. for the past past couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm good on that, that on that front. <laughs> so. I ended up going into something that I didn't want to go into, and I spent, you know, really the past like 15 years chasing that mistake. And, and along the way, I kind of meandered towards acting and stunt work, and uh, I realized early on that I can't, I'm, I'm terrible at any sport that requires some kind of round object. So I can't play basketball, I can't play soccer, I suck at pool. I'm, I'm like the world's only terrible ping pong player. What about football? Yeah, that's not a round. Player. That's not a round ball. Yeah, but it's a ball, and you're kicking it, and and I have a very low pain threshold when it comes to getting hit by big dudes. And it's low. Wait, so do, do do you feel like any of those previous lives, any of those previous careers, informed like your writing in any kind of significant way? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, the thing about the thing about the lives of Tao is it's kind of a chatty book, and yeah, there's aliens. Yeah, there's no. I'm rewriting history in, in a way, 
and you know it's it's an origin thriller but underneath all that stuff there it really is nothing more than a, than a bromance you know it's, it's a buddy flick between a boy and his alien or a middle-aged uh, 30 year old guy and his alien a 30 year old boy and his alien 30 year old boy I know alien. plenty of those trust me so wait a minute so your dad like many parents uh, says you know, you're you're going to get a very lucrative profession in your life. How did you end up becoming an actor slash IT person and then ending up becoming a writer anyway? Uh, because, so I spent the past 15 years doing, um, basically the kind of stuff I worked on was um, that the stuff that only like large financial institutions, banks, and you know insurance companies can, can use. And I'm not going to say that working at a bank is soul-sucking, but you know, soul kind of shriveled for the past you know 10 years or so. So I think around the time I was like 26, 27, um, I just started writing. I just, you know, kind of be like, well, my life kind of sucks. What, what else can I do with myself? How do I figure out what I was meant to do? Because this, this wasn't it, you know. So was the IT thing what satisfied your dad? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. They, they were very happy about because they're all about stability. Back in the 70s, when my parents were growing up, they, um, you know, their their thing was. Don't don't take risks. Just be stable. You know, we came all the way here from freaking Taiwan, mm -hmm. we lived in Nebraska for ten years. So, can you please make something of yourself? And I did. It kind of sucked. <laughs> but, but now you're doing what you love, and that's what's yeah, important. Yeah, now I'm doing what I love. So, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I'm still getting like these. My parents are like, so uh, when are you getting a job? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I just became a full time writer. That this is my job. Yeah. But, That's great. So can you tell us about the lives of Tao and, and what new readers can expect? So so the lives of Tao is a modern day science fiction about an alien who inhabits an out of shape loser and kind of convinces him to fight in a, in a civil war over control of humanity's evolution. So wow. the premise is these aliens crash landed on Earth a long time ago and they can't survive in our atmosphere but they realize that they can live inside the creatures of the planet. So, they, so they've so they kind of started inhabiting like the dinosaurs and the mammals, and eventually they found out that the primates and the humans were the ones that were evolving the fastest. So they kind of hitched their wagon to our horse, and they've been manipulating us ever since, trying to hope that one day we, we are technologically advanced enough to be able to ship and take them home. Okay, so they don't so, want to be here. They're they're they over want, it. They want to get out of here, right? So around the 1500s, um, the, these aliens, their mantra is, "Conflict breeds innovation." So we are going to put you in a state of like constant war, constant struggle, so that you're always, you know, inventing new things and and evolving at a better pace. And around the 1500s, one faction of these aliens realized that you know maybe instead of making them struggle, let's let's nurture them, let's help them a little bit. And they kind of went against what the mantra was, and then the the main faction basically went to war with them and created the Spanish Inquisition as a way of wiping, wiping them out. So for the past 500 years, they've kind of been going to war. So in the lives of Tao, this alien named Tao was with his host, and they were based they're infiltrating an enemy base, and they got stuck on top of the John Hancock Building. And the host basically commits suicide, jumps off the building. Is this a? No, that's not a spoiler. Okay, he jumps off the <laughs> building. It's the very first chapter. Okay. 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 All right. He jumps off the building and he kills himself so that the alien can find a new host. But the only one around at the time was this guy named Roland Tan, who is, you know, he loves his pizza. He is lazy. He's got a very low pain threshold. He's got no confidence in himself, and he's had opportunities to succeed in life, but he's never seized them. So Tao has this long journey where he base he um has to teach him how to fight, has him teach him how to teach him how to talk to girls, teach him how to lose weight, you know. Because for these aliens, once they're inside a host, they can't leave until the host dies. And they can't control the humans, they can only talk to them. So they're really stuck with each other. So he's trying to make the best out of a bad situation, like, all right, I'm stuck in this in this schmuck. Let's 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 clean up shop around here. Exactly. We're screwed, so we might as well figure this out, or I'll have you killed. And they're not in every single human. There's a, there's not that many of them, I guess. 
No, there, there's a couple hundred thousand of them. Okay. And they've been kind of slowly dying ever since. And they've just crash landed. They're just trying to get get away. They're, they were banished here. Well, Tom, that's that's actually interesting too because we were just talking on the last podcast about alien civilizations that that don't want to be here. But didn't we didn't didn't we have a whole thread about we're that in the forums? We're talking about why would aliens want to come here in the first place? Yeah. And then we kind of some people start talking about aliens that kind of get stuck here and are like, "Well, this is this is no fun." This is a bad idea. I mean, if an alien can go anywhere in space, would they really just want to hang out here for a long time? It's kind of we awesome. Don't, we don't actually have that many resources that, that they want. If they water, wanted salt water, yeah. Water is very plentiful. You know, I mean, the only thing that's really unique here is us. Mm. And we're, we're actually not that great. Well, yeah, we're unique great. on we the could planet. Do better. We don't know. Yeah, yeah exactly. All right, so um, you've got the Deaths of Tau out now as well, but we also have the Rebirths of Tau that you just uh, said is is coming for sure, right? Yes, that's coming December 31st. So what what can we expect in book three? I mean, not non-spoilery, but where is the story going? Okay, so... Ooh. <laughs> if, if, if you can't cross the line without being spoilery, yeah, we totally be understand. Line, we can so. we can move forward. <laughs> I, I will say that in the depths of Tao, I, I painted myself into a corner where I was kind of like, you know, at the time I wrote it, I'm like, oh, this is a really good ending. And, and then I didn't think about the consequences of having to write a third book. <laughs> so, so the publisher was like, you know, we really we would like a third book, and we want you to write it in like five months, and it's going to come out this year, and go. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> no, no. So, so um, I've always envisioned the Tao series as more than a trilogy, but what I wanted to do was, you know, finish Rowan and Tao's storyline within these three books. So, in the third book, the um, the first book was an origin story. The second book really, you know, ratcheted up the consequences, and the third book will finish a storyline as well as really give you know, the lives of Tao um, a premise to move on with, with, with following Tao's story without it only being with Rowan. Okay, so it's like it, 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 it's a good stopping point for this particular story. Exactly. But it doesn't necessarily mean the end of, of that ongoing tale. Because this war has gone on for 500 years. You know? It's not like all right, we're going to finish it all up and everything is done. We're, we, we win. You know, it's, it's more like this war is going to go on for a while and we're going to get closer to the finish line, but it's not going to happen in one person's lifetime or you know, the 25 or so years that the three books span. Gotcha. So, You've been prolific. I mean, you had bo both of the first two books came out last year, all in the same year, right? Yes. And now you've got another one coming out in, well, five months, a little more. Um, you're writing it. Right. Yeah. I'm writing it right now. So I uh, started writing it in January. The rough draft should be done by the end of this month, hopefully. Then I got a whole bunch of slogs to, to edit, and hopefully we'll get it in by July 1st. That's do you impressive. Do, do you do uh, beta readers and, and things like that to help you along? I have four sets of betas now. I mean, at, at this rate, what, once you're writing at a certain pace, um, you really need to be regimented in how you operate. So, like, you know, my wife does my first beta read, and then I got four other beta readers, and then I got a couple of bloggers now who are beta reading, and um, I got a copy editor. Because, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm averaging about 3,000 words a day right now. So, it's a little bit more than I was doing when I was um, not full time writing. Mm hmm. Got to live up to being a full-time writer now. I got to actually like yeah. wrap it up. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good that's a pretty good pace, I would say. I mean, that's that's two x nano rimo, uh, what nano rimo necessitates. So anything above that is is always very impressive to me. Yeah, I just did two months of straight nano rimo, and it's uh, my brain's kind of fried. <laughs> Now, uh, on Amazon, it says that if you like the deaths of Tao, you'll also like Chuck Wendig, uh, Jason M. Howe, Hoff, uh, Scott Lynch, and John Scalzi. Uh, so how does that make you feel, being compared to those guys, especially that Chuck Wendig, because you know him. He's kind of a, he, he's a tough cookie. I mean, I could think about 4,000 other worse authors to be compared to, so I'm, I mean, you know... I've been compared to John Scalzi a lot. I think John's fantastic, and um, he writes a, 
brand of like humorous military sci-fi that I identify with. Um, Scott's a friend of mine. He's fantastic too, and probably one of the, the wittiest, smartest guys I know. So I mean, Chuck has this, you know, his Blackbirds was genius, and you know, he's another guy that's incredibly prolific. I mean, the guy wrote like five books in the past, you know, eighteen months. So these are all like fantastic guys to be with. So yeah, I mean, um, I'm ten months into the release of my first book, so within the first eighteen months, I have three books out, and then I have you know a couple more of tour coming out next year. So you know, it's interesting because uh, you know we've we met you through other authors, and it seems like there's definitely a, a cabal of authors out there. As a new writer, how did you kind of how did how did you get in with that set? Uh. Conventions, that kind of stuff. I mean, conventions was a way to get was how I met Mike Cole, and 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 Mike's probably one of the most fantastic human beings I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I think it's at WorldCon in Chicago. We were hanging out, and um, and I see this guy with like this like tight, you know, this built guy with a tight shirt come in, and we're hanging out, and I buy him a beer, he buys me a beer, and before you know it, he, he introduces me to like you know ten other people, and then you know, I mean, and it's, it's something about it's, it's, cons are all about meeting other people, so. And and you know for 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 a very long time I was writing by myself. I didn't know there was, you know, this online community of writers. I didn't know about cons. I was just this one creepy dude in a cafe, writing by himself in the corner for like five years. So when I got to these cons, I was so happy that there was other people. You know, they're all hanging out here and they're all having beers. So I started hanging out with them, and that's kind of how I got to know everybody. It does seem like Mike Cole is one is a sort of the social organizer. He's the the guy that. He's the catalyst, maybe. Yeah, he's really good at introducing people to other people, and you know, making sure that everybody knows everybody else. And yeah, I mean, he's he's fantastic. He's probably one of the most honorable and nice human guy, like human beings I know. And I kind of feel bad sometimes that you know he's just so nice. <laughs> well, if he's the social nexus, what what role do you think Sam Sykes plays? I we have to if we don't mention Sam Sykes in every uh, live stream, he gets really upset and starts like spewing obscenities on Twitter. So we have to make sure we get that get that in there. Sam Sykes, I don't want to call him the anti Mike because <laughs> Sam's actually a really nice guy too. But uh, he was kind of an ass to me on the on the D and D game. <gasps> oh no! Did you guys oh, see no. that thing? That, that guy. I, he, I picked a gnome illusionist mm -hmm. so I can role play, mm. and he was picking on me the entire time. Was he, role, was he role playing picking on you? Was he like no, he was just picking on you or just being Sam picking on you? Time. I'm like, oh, oh. if you, yeah. Sam, you're ruining everyone's fun. Sam, you're ruining my fun, Sam. What was he even playing as? He's probably like a. Bird. Oh, he he was a dwarf. Of course dwarf, he was. Dwarf asshole. <laughs> a dwarf asshole. <laughs> I know that class. I've played against that class. <laughs> I deal with a lot of uh, that on on yeah. That's like it's kind of like the troll class in a, right. in a sense. That's funny. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, they're, they're all great guys. We're just teasing them. So I could ask you like a really weighty uh, question about early influences and it kind of be like directing you towards that Shakespeare Machiavelli section. Uh, but I noticed that you. Bravely, boldly, and without shame, admitted that you read Sweet Valley High as a kid. Yeah, I did. I, I wrote Sweet Valley High. I, I read um, what, what was that 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 one of the veterinarians um, animal? Was it? There's one of there's a oh, one of girl who's a veterinarian and she worked at her dad's vet. Does she have like red hair or yeah, something? Like yeah, that, her name is Valentine or something like that. Okay. Oh, I read. I was Babysitter's Club, so I don't I know read, what read, uh, what you're talking about at all. Well, so here's what happened: is Danny Dunn. When you grow up in the '80s, like I did, <clears throat> and like I did as well, I'm not that much older than you. You were born good, in the good, '80s. Good genes. I was. Uh, but um, <laughs> so when you're in grade school in the '80s, um, in Nebraska, by the way. You, you, I think you get these these catalogs of, of like of books. Yeah, like you have the book club. That. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, we had yeah. those too. The those Scholastic Book Club catalog. Yeah, you take the catalogs home and and you check them off, and your parents like sign up on them and write you a check, and and you order books, and then in like in a few weeks you get a bunch of books. Mm -hmm. It's like Christmas I, in homeroom. Exactly. I impoverished my parents because I bought all the damn books. And the reason why I got into the Babysitters Club and Flubber and 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 Animal High or whatever it was, Flubber! Animal Hospital, Beverly Cleary, it, I, I I literally ran out of books to buy. 
Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of why. You're like, I already have all these. I need something. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. I, mean, no, I, wanted, to be, I wanted to be a vet for like five years because of that, the, that series, and then I realized that I can't stand blood. Oh, okay. I was going to yeah. say, see, you, but you almost you, you missed your chance because you didn't want to become go into the medical field. You could have just done that for animals, but you still have to stick knives and sh sharp things into animals. See, see, that's the thing is I don't mind blood when I'm sparring or when I get punched or mm -hmm. when I punch somebody, but I mind blood when they're being cut open. Yeah. Can I make you pass out if I talk about my surgery? Yeah. I, like would you pass out live on the air? If I watch Grey's Anatomy, and I admit I watch Grey's Anatomy. Um, I do too. Yeah, it's a good show. But and when they have that the fake operating thing, I'm always like, oh my god. Ugh. I was like the worst part about watching Dexter. Like I can never oh, stand yeah. when he would cut people on the face because I hate seeing the scalpel like cut split skin. Like it's like, Ugh. I'm not squeamish either. I just hate that uh, that very specific effect. I like that. I like watching Dexter in Game of Thrones, and I'm always like, that's a that's a good stab, you know. <laughs> he stabbed, <laughs> he stabbed stab. them real good. But then if you do surgery where they're like, you know, messing around with the guy's like, insides, I'm, I'm like, whoa. That's funny. I'm less squeamish about that. I'm more squeamish about very precise. Anyway, we're totally off topic. Uh, Sam Sykes wants to know why you're such a big fat liar. Dude, that video is online. Ugh. All you have to do is watch that video and you'll be like, oh, Sam Sykes is kind of a jerk. <laughs> uh, I accidentally. All right. Well, this is funny. We know he's not because he's been on the show. But he no, he's, he's a great guy. I'm just kidding. Sam's a good guy. Yeah. So I clicked on that video and I started watching it, and I was really high on painkillers, <laughs> and so it was like in the background for a really long time. And I think I accidentally tweeted it out on the Sword and Laser YouTube channel because oh, right. I. I I, did you see that, Tom? Yes, you saw I me did. Do that? I caught that. I think I just left it up because I was like, whatever, everyone should watch this. This is hilarious. <laughs> so that was... No, I, you I followed up admitting that it wasn't supposed to be posted and then you left it, yeah. I did. I did follow... The, I, I don't remember. So. Yeah. I really should not have access to TweetDeck or TweetBot when I'm, you know, on that those many drugs. It's it's not a good idea. We should probably, we actually have other questions from, yeah. from real audience members that are not Sam Sykes. Um, the first one is from Caleb. Uh, he says, sorry for the typical author question, but I must know what inspired you to write The Lives of Tao. Uh, would the TV show Chuck have anything to do with it? Chuck always comes to mind when reading your books. Uh, you know, I actually did not see Chuck until after someone made that comparison. Mm. So... I mean, I saw the first. I saw the first, like the first season, and I totally see where people get it from. But um, the, the the original, what happened was, I wanted. To, I, I'm a big history fan. I, I know history is my favorite class in, in high school and college, and um, I've always thought that there was enough going on in history where I didn't have to retell it. So, but instead of retelling history, I wanted to you know rewrite and ex re-explain history. So, you know, everything in the lives of Tao still happen based on how history actually occurred. But you know, the motivation behind how everything happened now has the aliens instead of, you know, instead of what actually happened. So mm -hmm. that was my premise to write the, the novel. But then once I created the relationship between Tao and Rowan, you know, that kind of took the focus of what the story was about. So it became not so much about this alien war where, you know, we're manipulating mankind, but these two people who are stuck with each other who you know are trying to make things work out and who really become best friends and you know lean on each other for support. Timothy uh, says, "I truly love the Tao books. Is it hard to handle characters with so much in their backstories, like you're just talking about? And how does he do it?" Ah, so so all the aliens basically have their own kind of you know their process. So so Tao used to be in Genghis Kong, and then he then you know at one point he was in Lafayette. And what happened was I had to write out an entire you know, timeline for where he was at. at. You know, at one point, you know, assuming Genghis Khan lived from 1160 to you know, 1250 or whatever, where could he go next? And for him, he went south. He you know, founded the guy who was with the, you know, the, the Lotus Society and then became the first Ming emperor. And I just kind of mapped out his, you know, historically where he was, where he could go next, and you know what characters would make him more interesting. You know, every character that that was in Tao, that Tao was in, 
you know, he is still kind of part of him. You know, kind of, kind of built upon his experience of you know he considered Tao considered Genghis Khan his great failure, and mm -hmm. and not because he conquered his huge empire because that's awesome, but because his original intention was to create a stable empire, and Genghis Khan's empire kind of fell apart right when he died. Mm -hmm. So that's such an elegant way to do it too, because you can find people at these inflection points in history where you know we we always debate like what makes the great man become the great man and your answer is well tao actually is. <laughs> i mean tao tao's done some good things and he's done some really bad things too you know i mean both like i i didn't want either faction to be the good faction and the bad faction there's there's the gooder faction and the badder faction but you could argue that both sides are are technically correct just their philosophy of how to reach their goals are different Gotcha. Our next question is from Terp Kristen, and uh, she says, his bio says that he's an avid gamer, so what types of games, video, pen and paper, board, all of the above, uh, are you playing, and, and what's he playing now, and does he play regularly? Well, obviously, we, we kind of figured out that you're a D&D &D guy, but what else are you spending your time on? Uh, I used to play a lot of per first-person shooters and strategy games. Mm -hmm. um, I stopped playing board games when I, I kind of lost all my friends in Chicago. It's... So, so for a long time, I, I was working, you know, full time, and then I'd work out, and then I'd go to, you know, my Tai Chi, Kung Fu classes, whatever. And um, and then once I started writing, it's, you know, it's baked in my entire life is like work, write, working out. And eventually, you lose all your friends. So mm. once you run out of guys to play Magic the Gathering with, and run out of guys, you know, to, to hang out and play, you know, Axis and Allies with, um, it's all online. So when I turned 30... I realized that I can't beat anybody in first-person shooters anymore. <laughs> Although, <laughs> like you play Call of Duty, or like Modern Warfare, I literally, I, I like, I like, you know, spawn and mm -hmm. I get headshot in like six seconds. Dude, it's like my my husband plays Call of Duty and he's on Titanfall now, and oh, um, game, yeah. he is really good. Like I tease him, he'll be playing, and uh, if he's not like doesn't have the top score for kills or at least top score for assists, I'm like. I don't even know you. Just get this, out of here. This is, step this old is man. not. Yeah, this is. You're you're old now. This is the beginning of the end. Well, Titanfall is a little different. I, I played that beta for Titanfall, and it's one of the games where it wasn't as like, you know, Unreal slash, you know, Call of Duty kind of twitch. So I could live for like a couple minutes, maybe a couple seconds. Mm -hmm. let's, yeah. Let's, let's, let's get ahead of myself here. A couple couple of seconds. So I can live a little bit. But um. Anyways, back to the question. Back to the question is. Right now, I'm only playing Dota's. Hmm. I'm, I'm playing, which is probably the worst thing I could be playing. And I'm playing Heroes of New Earth, and um, I suck at it. <laughs> so let's, let's just get that on the board right now. I suck at it. So, um, but yeah, that's what I'm playing. I mean, otherwise, I don't really have a lot of time. I used to play Warcraft, World of Warcraft, and I was like a raiding officer and. Now, the thing about being a, a raid leader or like no, being an officer in a guild that raids is um, it's like a job. It's like project management. You know, it, it's like doing my job, but instead of getting paid, I get loots. I get epic loots. Yeah, you get paid in epic get, loot. Yeah, or you paid. get to decide who gets the epic Cauldron. loots. It, it is kind of, it's kind of empowering. You know, it's kind of like I'm I'm kind of like like a small warlord when when I'm when I'm playing World of Warcraft. And after a while, I was like, this is. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Well, I have to ask the inevitable question then. Horde oh, or Alliance, yeah. what do you play as? I've only played Horde. All right! Yay! <laughs> Finally! <laughs> Thank you. Horde. Oh, wow. We talked to so many people who play Stupid Alliance. I have never like, leveled a character uh, like an Ning. Ever. I have no idea what the storyline is for Alliance. I only did one. I leveled... Um, I, I played as a, a dwarf hunter named Glaucos, and um, I got him up to, uh, like, 40 and then, oh, um, wow. then we decided to start the guild that we that that me and Scott Johnson and, and Randy started, uh, Ali Ayakta Est, and it turned ended up be we did it on the Horde side um, on an RP server. Ended up being the biggest guild in North America, and what? I think it is still the biggest community. We just had to split it up into multiple guilds. When did you quit? I quit. Oh, I quit almost two years ago. Yeah, I've been two years clean. I quit right before, <laughs> right before, um, right before. She hung pandas. up her heirloom shoulders. 
Is that is that would that be about two years? Yeah, I think I quit right right as Pandas was coming out. I quit uh, in Cataclysm. Oh, hmm. okay. So you went you're a little bit earlier. Was that was that long? I have no idea. I have like from like 2007 to 2011, my my like my all my years are just one big one big haze. Yeah, um, gosh, I, I don't remember when Cataclysm came out because it was it went Cataclysm, Lich King, and then Pandas. No, it was Lich right? King then Cataclysm. It was Lich King then Cataclysm. Then Pandaria, yeah. Cataclysm was my favorite expansion by far. Anyway, we're off topic again. I because this is what happens when I, when I take my happy. Pills. No, it was it was all in answering to Kristen's question. Yes, it was all it was yes. all part of that precisely. I'm playing Dota's and I am sucking at Dota's right now. Is what it is. Are you playing any beside besides Heroes of New Earth or just that one? I mean, like I I have Shogun. You know, like uh-huh. any game that doesn't require me to overly twitch myself, I mm-hmm. can play. Um, I, I'm 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 teetering on Titanfall right now. Oh, do it! It's so good. If I would, if I wasn't busted up, I would be playing that nonstop. It's super fun. Everybody's playing on Xbox, though. Yeah, yeah. I don't have, I don't have an Xbox. Mm. So oh. I'm kind of like I'll be by myself. We'll start a Kickstarter fund. No, no one will play. With to me. get no an one. Xbox. We'll chip, we'll chip in. We'll chip in to get Wes, a, Wes an Xbox and and play some Titanfall. Uh, I'd be okay with that if you guys. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> I'm not gonna say no to that. Yeah, How about it? Yeah. <laughs> I bet if Sam bought you an Xbox, everything would be good. Yeah, Sam should buy you an Xbox. Sam would be my best friend. I will never say anything bad about him ever again. Sam, buy him an Xbox. There you go. All right, done deal. Uh, Michael has a question. Have you given any thought to the sorts of things you want to write when the Tao series comes to a climactic conclusion? You did mention you got a couple planned for next year, right? Um, well, I'm hoping that in the long run, you know, I can do books four or five and six for the Tao series. I could, you know, I could be like Piers Anthony and see how see how high I can hit. But um, I do have a series coming out with Tor. Uh, I don't have the release date yet. I believe the first book should come out around mid-2015 and the second book in 2016. So uh, it's a more serious novel, not, not so lighthearted, but um, it's, kinda, it's, about a time, it's about a time traveler with PTSD. Hmm. That seems like something that should have come up before now. Like, how could time travel not give you PTSD? Well, it depends on what you're time traveling for. Yeah, I suppose so. But just just the idea of like being out of time, I would think, would mess with people's heads. Well, that that was his, so the guy's job. So in 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 Time Salvager, um, which is a tentative title because Tor might change it, but um, it's about a guy whose job is to go back into what they call dead end timelines. A dead dead end timeline is say uh, right before a ship explodes, or right before say the Titanic sinks, or a moon base has a catastrophe. So his job, you know, he's from the, from the 25th century, is to go back and harvest, say, resources, um, power sources, food, you know, priceless oh. artworks or whatever. So to harvest these things, jump in, grab everything, and get out before the explosion happens. Hmm. That's so stressful. It, so it doesn't affect the timeline. The problem with his job, though, is that he experiences the last terrible moments of all the victims. Oh, that's no good. And he can't do anything about it. That's amazing. I want to read that. I can't so wait. Because of, so because of that, he, you know, he's kind of he's an alcoholic, he's kind of suicidal, he, he and, and um, you know, he's just he's all messed up. And at one point, he goes back in time and before um, a reactor explodes and he befriends a scientist. And and right before, the, you know, everything is about to go to hell, he on an impulse, he pulls her back with him, which is against the law. Mm. Totally tempting, though. That is so. That that's time salvager in a nutshell. That's that sounds really good. That does sound pretty awesome. Yeah, I like that. Um, I guess our final question is from Tabitha, and she wants to know how difficult do or did you find it writing a female character's point of view? Oh. Um, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> she's, I, I don't actually treat my women characters that different from my male char- my men characters. I, I, I mean, um, I'm hoping that I can delve into the YA world soon, and um, I have a character in mind. And what I, what I realized is that everybody has the same kind of kind of issues. You know, they, they think the same, their process is the same. Your, your main characters, there, there's not like a 
there's not like a I think like a man. There's not like I think like a woman in terms of you know how they react. I find it a little bit more difficult because I'm more cognizant of the fact that I don't want to screw it up. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to fall into like a bad stereotype or, or trope about how a woman character is like. But I don't also know what all of them are. So, um, and that's why I find it difficult. And, and not because writing a woman or the way they think is, is different. It's just because I'm trying to be more sensitive about how I portray a woman so that I portray them accurately, but just like, like any other person. So, right. Yeah. No, I think that's I think that's a great way of doing it. Yeah, being being sensitive the, to the tropes while also just writing them the way you would write a male character, essentially. Exactly. I like that. All right. Well, I think that's all we've got for you, Wes. Where can people uh, follow your work online on the internet? You can find me at wesleychu.com, or uh, my Twitter handle is wes underscore chu c h u. Go into any conventions anytime in the near future. Uh, okay, so this year is going to be MoCon, which is Maurice Broaddus' convention, um, Worldcon. Ooh, nice. I, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to London. Uh, World Fantasy Convention in D.C., and I am going to Phoenix Comic Con and Convergence. Nice. So very, very good selection of events, for sure. More on my slate this year. Well, you should you should try to make it Dragon Con one year. Uh, we 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 go every year and we love it. Okay, that's uh, a good one. When is Dragon Con? It is uh, Labor, Labor Day, Day weekend. Yeah. yeah. September, right? September, right. end of August, September. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll think about it. Yeah, make it make it happen. It's a good time. I will make it so. Make it so. And if you guys want to follow us, we are on Twitter at Sword and Laser. On YouTube, we are at uh, youtube.com slash the Sword and Laser. The website is swordandlaser.com. And all of our discussions, as always, happen over on Goodreads. We will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys.